Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Christian formation time. I've got a few folks around the table. I have a strong feeling there will be more coming in. But yes, they are live people for this Bible study discussion. There they are. And uh, we are continuing in the book of Colossians with the series called Teaching Christ to Christians. We've been talking about Colossae, which is this um, uh, city, the small little city in Western Asia Minor, which is present day Turkey, not that far from Ephesus. And uh, it's a city that had a lot of different religious influences. And the new Christians from this new church that was planted there by one of Paul's colleagues were getting a little confused and overwhelmed by everything. And so this letter of Colossians was written to them to try to help them clear things up and kind of recenter on the teachings of Christ. So last week we talked a little bit about what the opponents were saying, that there were requirements <laughs> such as um, certain festivals or Sabbath observances or food rules kind of from the Jewish tradition. There was also some things that could be traced back to different branches of mysticism or the Roman Hellenistic stuff of, of elemental spirits running things. And so you wanted to worship these angels, these, these spirits all of which was to get you access to God, right? That was the point of religion for a lot of folks back then. Get you access to God or to the gods so that they would in turn hear your prayers and bless you and help your crops grow and things like that. So uh, this letter is saying you don't need all that extra stuff because through your baptism, Christ is already in you, already at work in you. You have complete access to God through this gift of knowledge, through this gift of, of the Lord. And there's one thing I did not touch on last week that I forgot to. I'll do real briefly here. Uh, a, a couple of weeks ago on our, our on the day where I made the sales pitch to everybody on what our Bible studies would be, we ended up having a, a little bit of a conversation based on the summer midweek messages about uh, Christian nationalism and, and Nazism in the churches in Germany. And I think Emily may have asked something about where is that, like, is that anti-Semitism in the Bible or where did that come from? So one of the passages, you know, last week is what some people latched onto to build some of that theology. So by this letter having a contrast between, no, you don't need to have these, these food observances, these, these other things, and everybody heard that as, a, as Jewish practices. You don't need to have those to have access to God. Later generations grabbed onto that and said, well, that means that the New Testament has superseded the Old Testament. That's mm -hmm. the term. That Jesus has now replaced and overwritten all those old covenants. That was big in the 70s. Yeah, it's big and big for a while. Yeah. And so as opposed to saying, no, oh, those covenants still stand, and here is the new covenant through Christ. And so it's lines like this that have been used to justify how first... Jesus supersedes the Jews, and then you build onto that to say, oh, well, the Jews killed Jesus, so they're under a curse, and so therefore, whatever bad things happen to Jewish people, it's justified. This is God's wrath on them for rejecting Christ. So it, it was one, that would be one of those stepping stones, one of those building blocks. So That's a big leap. Well, it, it, but it, it was gradual. It is a big leap if you go just from there to yeah. Nazi Germany. But if you add in centuries and centuries of people taking that, interpreting it, adding on to it, saying, well, look, they got kicked out of this country, too. See, like it, it just built into this whole culture of demonizing and scapegoating. Oh, yes, this week there was, I saw uh, that. Pope, the Pope and uh, the Nazis, the Pope yeah. and the Holocaust, and stuff like that. Yeah. And it was really interesting. Kind of, it was kind of like the Pope just kind of turned his back. You know, mm -hmm. just try to ignore it. Totally. So there was a change in popes during the Nazi regime. This was in the book too. The the Pope, what was it, Pius the Twelfth and Pius the Thirteenth, something like that. I, I, yeah, Pius, mm -hmm. I can remember. Yeah, because he's the one they. I, yeah. I didn't remember being. He was a skinny little guy. Yeah. <laughs> so Pius the Twelfth was pushing back a little bit and supporting some of the bishops and parishes in France and and other places. But Pius XIII came in and was so worried because it was so ingrained, especially in German culture, that the Jews were the enemy. And World War II was seen from that perspective as defeating world Jewry and, and saving Christianity and saving the world from these the evil influence of these Jews. That's how it was built. Then 
the the pope was like if i push too hard like i can i can do this in belgium i can do this in france i can do this in the netherlands but if i pushed back too hard against the germans then i stand a very good chance of the entire german catholic population leaving or having to be excommunicated if i draw too hard a line so he was basically doing the waiting game and not trying to push back too hard they were still trying to shelter folks and and there'd be some diplomatic little slaps on the wrist of, hey, you weren't supposed to round up Jews in Rome, you know, because Italy was fascist, was under the same. But yeah, Pius XIII played a real hands-off. Well, Chamberlain and him? Well, yeah, that was going around. Yeah, but they did one other thing after the war was over, they shoveled a lot of Nazis out through, through the... Oh, yeah. Through uh, yeah. Catholicism, through the priests and things. So. So yeah, a lot of the priests. Yeah, but he was not, he yeah. was culpable for that. So oh, yeah, that. totally. But both the Protestant and the Catholic churches led a, a bunch of the clergy who'd been trained up in this way of thinking to stick around and keep preaching, keep teaching. So anyway, that's a little callback, but I wanted to kind of make that connection since we talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, you're completely right that it's it's a big jump <laughs> to get just from don't follow the Jewish rules anymore. You don't need to be circumcised. Um, you have a spiritual circumcision, it said. To so go from there to Jews are evil. But even when I was in the military in the 70s, it was a big deal. Um, yeah. Same, same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, the ship that I was going to be on uh, had just been commissioned. And they gave away, uh, it was the USS Eisenhower. And they gave away Bibles, believe it or not, on, on its commissioning. And it was only the New Testament, because the theory was that that's all you needed now. That, oh, that, that's, yeah, I've seen that. That it, it superseded yeah. Yeah. the Old Testament. You didn't need it anymore. And that yeah. went around. That was prevalent in the military in the seventies. Oh, it's it's prevalent in a lot of places. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I've always all my life, I've been if the Jews were bad, I mean, right? You just need to. You can't date that person. They're right. Jewish. Well, and Lutherans would say that about Catholics too, and that's oh, part yeah. of the reason why yeah. people didn't trust JFK was because. Well, he'll just do whatever the Pope says. In the Midwest, I think, yeah, there was more. We didn't have any Jewish, but we had a lot of Catholics. Yeah. Well, so, I, thought, I didn't know there was a difference between Protestants growing in Pennsylvania. It was either you went to church or you were a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've said before, I've had a number of people over the years, especially in terms of like premarital stuff, mm -hmm. or just sharing how they got together as a couple, say, well, I was Baptist and they were Methodist. You know, we were two different religions. I'm like, no, <laughs> no it's not two different religions. When my wife's sister got married, um, her husband was Catholic and he was a friend of mine. Yeah. And they would be outed every Sunday if they didn't show up at church. Right. The priest would out them the following Sunday. He said, well, I wish you had been here last and called my name. So you, you okay. would get called by name when you didn't show up. And, wasn't just uh, Catholics. Did that but, help or hurt? Well, what he would do is he would, he would get to church early and park his car where his folks could see it. And then he'd walk to my house about a mile away <laughs> and he'd be back before church was out and sitting on the front portico so his folks would see him there. So <laughs> he never got out of it, but he'd come down to my house. Okay? <laughs> but um, he, he converted to Lutheranism. Yeah. And, and her other sister married a Catholic and she converted to Catholicism. Yeah, and that could and get, I thought my I thought my mother was going to have cats. Yep, that could be very enough to get you disowned from your family. We have it in our family. Her. My brother, my sister in law is Catholic. My grandfather was a Lutheran minister. Uh oh. And when all she, all he would refer to her as a that Catholic girl. We <laughs> <laughs> love her. And so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus and his disciples were all Jewish. The New Testament doesn't make sense unless you understand every other sentence referencing back to the Old Testament. There's so many quotes and allusions and, and references. And then the same way, Luther was Catholic. Right. And so the Lutheran Mass, the Lutheran yeah. worship service, was almost exactly the same as the Catholic Mass, with some very big and important theological differences that had more to do with the corruption of the church than than the teaching, although there was some. He considered him a Catholic until he died. Exactly. So he never, he, he even wrote that he, you know, the thought of having people called Lutherans was like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, mm -hmm. he didn't want that. That's you know, a direct I, quote. I pointed that out to my mom, yeah. that Luther, mm -hmm. Luther was Catholic yeah. um, when I married a Catholic. Yeah. Wonderful man. Yeah. Well, yeah, she wasn't real happy about that. <laughs> that 
point. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was brought up a Catholic, and so Protestants was a bad word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Jews, whoa, that's even worse than Protestant. Right. Yeah. And so what, a, I mean. I mean. So it's, it's, it's uh, once you, yeah. It's racism. And not only yeah. Very demeaning. Yeah, they would. I mean, they would say it's, it's anti-Semitic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. It might be more casual. It might be more every day, as opposed to like graffiti or bombs right, or right. something. But yeah, it's, it's still there. Start going right. And... One of the things they would say when I was a kid, and a business burned down or something like that. Sure. You'd hear some well, was in a G flat. Oh my gosh! Oh my <laughs> goodness! Really? Oh, yeah. okay. Or there was there was a slang too. If somebody, if you got like. Well, gypped isn't great either. It's, it's like gypsies, but yeah. you got, uh, you got you, exactly. You got and so those things. So here's the thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna segue this because we want to get out yeah. on time for the <laughs> other folks coming in. So nowadays we have all of this stuff that we're becoming more aware of, and so we're trying to live as better neighbors. And so whether it's Jews or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, we try to live in in more harmony and, and understanding than maybe generations past because we understand looking at history understanding better context of things that if somebody can turn on one religion they could just as easily turn on ours too oh, no. and if you want to show the love of christ then you love your neighbor as yourself so you you build relationships you you learn from each other we did that whole series on our neighbor's faith i'm not a muslim but i think it's kind of amazing that for those who take that seriously, five times a day, they stop and pray. And well, I know Christians who do that too. They'll have certain passages of scripture, certain prayers. Monks and nuns do that, right? Certain hours of the day. So there's something in that. There's something that strengthens your faith. There's things we can learn from each other. And in that learning and that openness, we therefore are trying to create a two-way street where folks can learn from our witness as well. And we let the Holy Spirit work on that. And so you, I'm going to segue that back to here. So they didn't have, you know, Buddhists and Hindus and, and Muslims, but they did have some Jewish influences. They had Roman and Greek worship practices. They had these sort of cults that would worship um, angels and things like that. And in this context, no. You know, on the one hand, are they saying go persecute those people, go string them up and torture them like the Spanish Inquisition? No. At the, are they saying religious tolerance? No, they're not that far either. Because this was a brand new church who didn't even know what Christianity was yet. They're still figuring it out. So you take things in the context they're in. Don't use this as justification for anti-Semitism or for persecuting other religions. Use this to say, wow, there's a lot going on in my world too. I want to make sure I know what's at the core, like we've been saying. I want to know what's at the, the heart of my faith. I want to tap into Christ who is in me and follow this teaching, this treasure, these riches that God has put in me through my baptism. So there's Lutherans are very good because we started as Protestant, as protesting. We started as saying, here's what we're against. We don't want to do that. So we have this heritage where we're really good at saying what we aren't, but sometimes we have a lot of trouble saying what we are and what we do believe. We're really good at saying, well, we're not like the Baptists. We're not like the Catholics. <laughs> I'm really good at that. But it's sometimes harder to articulate what we are about. And so that's where we come back to grace. It's where we come back to we're simultaneously sinners and saints. Some of these Lutheran classics where uh, we talk about you're justified by grace through faith in Christ. All these things. So we, we come back to these pieces that really speak to what the Lutheran emphasis and accent is among the Christian faith. Um, because it's at the core, so we want to share it with others. It's important to us. So that's that's where we come back to. So last week we had the anti. Don't do this. Don't you know? Don't worship these things. Don't do these meetings. Don't do these practices. You don't need all of that stuff. Um, and then at the end it says, you know, if with Christ you died to these elemental spirits, why do you live like you still belong to the world? You know, clean up your act. Live in an upright way. Everybody's eyes are on you, right? You're brand new. People are looking for any excuse to come after you. So live an upright life because you've been transformed. So now in chapter three, we get the more details on how you live a life um, that that puts that helps your reputation and helps the faith, that shows that you are transformed, that shows that you're living a new life. 
So that's what we have this week. Um, kind of the main premise in the first four verses is, <laughs> if, if this is true, follow through. I made a rhyme. If this is true, if you are new in Christ, then follow through. Live like it. Um, you do have access to God. Now live it. So who would like to read verses one through four? So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in the Lord. Thank you. So you're new. You're, you're new in Christ. So live this new life. Um, set your minds on things that are above, not things that are. Um, all right, let's just jump right ahead. Who would like to do verses 5 through 11? This is kind of the therefore. So if you are new, therefore. Thank you, Roger. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly. Fornication, impurity, passion, evil, desire, greed, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living in that life. But now you have, but now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of, your, of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek, Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but in Christ and all, and in, is all and in all. There you go, thank you. All right, so don't do these bad things because you're new. That's, that's kind of the, the short version. Anything on this list of prohibitions that surprises you or anything you would you would add? <laughs> this uh, um, I, I'm I'm going through a personal sort of transformation as far as uh, really fighting to lose some weight. And I read, so this translation says, um, you know, bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, and dirty talk. And all of those, I went towards me. You know, my brain, <laughs> my brain said, okay, you're, tr you're, you're going through this as well. Stop negative talking towards yourself. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. You can be your own worst enemy. I was going to say, yeah. Right. <laughs> Easy. I mean, I was telling my kids the other day, like, man, you've been on your phones way too much lately. And I'm like, I know I do it too. <laughs> I said, there are days where I do it too much. So I'm trying to nip it in the bud for you because I know it's not good. But yeah, like, whatever you want to, that, that's another Christian issue sometimes is we're really good at being like, this is what everything you're doing wrong and like not. Also. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A good example exactly. <laughs> I mean, as, you know, you described in Western culture. I mean, really, there's it's so much of it prevalent in everything we do every day. Yeah, you sit there with a glass of wine and a cigarette and say, the kids shouldn't drink or smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there is, there's a lot of, I see that, the one that really jumps out to me is greed. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of greed going on. I just saw a graph the other day that the richest 10% of Americans have more than 50% of the country's wealth. And then the next, the middle class, which was like, I don't even know. The next chunk had like, <coughs> like 40%, like 49%. And then like, it was some crazy number, like 50% of the population had 1% of the wealth. It was something crazy. So I look at greed, and I think everybody buys into that. Like, man, I want more stuff. But like, I want to keep up with the Joneses. I would challenge that perception of those are, that's not greed necessarily as accumulation. So you, okay. we should not judge those people that have that because they do give 
if it's hard to give, you have nothing. Sure. You can't give. You That's can't true. be philanthropic. Phil- 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 I can't <laughs> Phil- but Phil- you, Thank you. You can't do that. Yeah. You also can't employ people. That's true. Board. That's true. So there's a yeah. whole lot of there's a lot of thinking there that we test. I hate the classism that is in the media today. Oh, no, no. It says that rich or bad, poor or good. good. No, it no, doesn't no. work that way. So I, I, I push back against Sorry. that thought really quickly. I'm and I'm, I'm not trying to say that I hate the, the ones that have accumulated, mm-hmm. but I'm saying there have been many loopholes and rules put in place for the, to allow that. And on general, poor people on average give more of what little they have proportionally than... If you go up the ranks, that's that's been. But there's shown some I just read in the paper last couple of days. The guy who owns some big clothing company. Carol oh, just gave jacket. it. Gave it away. Just, he's given, Patagonia. He's given, <laughs> yes, he's given his profits to some environmental. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I'm sure he kept enough. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure he did. You know, when I see the angle, wrath, malice, I think of what I don't do Facebook, I don't do oh, social gosh. media, yeah. but. If it's actually going on, what I hear is going on there, yeah. that's kind of the definition, and yeah. they just feed off of each other. It's, yeah, it's, and it's easier to do because it's enough. Because, but yeah, it's easy to do because or, you're not standing in front of somebody. Right. Yeah. 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 It makes I'll a big difference if you're standing in front of them and you get to poke the face. Yeah. Poke the person, you know, yeah. so. and, I'm, and I'm not trying to do too much of a broad stroke. I just, that graphic was starting to strike, and it's it's a bigger differential than years past. So. Whether or not folks are being generous with that accumulated and creating the jobs and all that, I, I think they are. But I do know that the the proportion has widened over the years. One of the things that I struggle with is one of the things that I struggle with is my parents were depressionary. Oh yeah. So I suffer. It's either it's either good or bad. I don't know how you want to look at it. That I had depressionary people uh, as family. So I was taught you don't do anything, don't throw anything away. Because they didn't have anything. In the pot, I wouldn't have brought it out. So it, I, I probably got some stuff. When I moved into the house, I'm gonna give you an example. When I moved into my house 29 years ago, I still have stuff in the attic with the sticker still on. I mean, <laughs> so, so you, you to never my point, I, I never throw anything away. Uh, I visited so, a shut-in for a while who grew up telling, you know, she told stories how she grew up sticking newspaper in her shoes and. Mm-hmm. and walking along the train tracks, looking for coal that fell out to help heat the house. De- very depression era. And she complained how her adult children would throw paper towels away and not dry them out and reuse them. My mother laid them out to dry it and reused them. But it, it's yeah. people who were giving this. At, at MSEP, we sit and sort clothes every Friday. And if we take in 30 bags, I bet at least 15 to 18 of them go straight to recycle. Oh, somebody can use this. Yeah, I'm sure our clients really need equal gowns and, <laughs> um, you know, and 50 year old clothes. And so they just, oh, they they're pat they're themselves, stuff. they pat, they pat <laughs> themselves on the back for what they're doing. Yeah. But, and it's like I've read, you know, in the United States, oh, we give all this to other countries, but sure. we send winter clothes to <laughs> countries on the equator. We'll, we, s- yeah. <laughs> we'll send the t shirts of a team that didn't win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> they were already printed. Oh, sure. And, you know, and we, you know, between all sorts of factors, we waste enough food in this country. I forget if it was per week or per month. To oh, fill a stadium, our poor waste is insane. It is, yes. yeah. So, and that, that's the part of the greed too. So, there's there's so much of, of greed, not just being accumulating or or hoarding or or you know whatever, but also the wastefulness. There's a, a company now that you can buy vegetables, un, un, un blemished vegetables. Yeah. Because right. the grocery stores, the average person doesn't want to see an apple that's got blemish on. They want that perfect apple. Yep. So the stores throw yep. those things away. Right. What they, what they did, yeah. there's a company out there now that you can do it. It's, it's done. Uh, Ugly vegetables, best, yeah. Best, 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 yeah. Yeah, a couple of them, yeah. And my daughter bought them for a while, but it got too expensive, so she quit doing it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's a oh, good yeah, idea. Oh, yeah, expensive. It's a good idea <laughs> to do that. Um, they, they got blemished foods that wouldn't yeah. be thrown away otherwise, and they sell it that way, and it's perfectly good stuff. Well, IMSA brings um, vegetables. Uh, I mean, IMSA. Uh, all sold brings vegetables to IMSA. So it's not Thursday night. Because it's Thursday night, we can't keep it till Monday, so mm-hmm. we have to uh, take as much tomatoes, yeah. blah, 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 as you need. Well, I had this young um, 
a person there and she said, and tomatoes are small, huh. you know, they haven't had much the rain and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And she goes, um, well, I use them for slicing sandwiches. I said, these are not really that good. Some of them have blemishes on them and some of them are soft. And she goes, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I said, well, you can cut them up, make a sauce. And she was like, what? Yeah. You make a sauce with it? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, you know, you want so to you're, you're talking like that. And yeah. then Pat comes up, Pat Hubert, he goes, oh, you can do da -da 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 -da. <laughs> So he says, I do the training on some of these things. Mm -hmm. and He's written his own cookbook. He's got his yeah. cookbook. And so he hands it to her and she was like, Oh my gosh, yeah. this is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. It's like she had no clue. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, that was actually the thing I was thinking. Is some of what we're talking about, people are. Yeah, yeah. And sure. when God peers into our heart, right. I like to think that he can decipher between people yeah. and my yeah. ignorance of my actions. If, yeah. you've, right. if you've grown up in a society that's that stresses convenience, and ours really does, then how would you ever learn that you could make your own tomato sauce? You just get it in a jar. Just punches out there. <laughs> how would you know that, oh, well, I just cut off the blemish if, if all you ever see are the perfect things? Well, that's the problem about you talking about the different caste systems, the class systems financially. Uh, I read an article, somebody was sure enough, but I didn't follow up on it. But most of fast food is done by the lower class um, yeah. people, which is, has the least amount of value. There's a thing food called a, a food desert. Yeah. So if all if your only source for groceries is the convenience <laughs> store, then you're going to get all the processed crap, all yeah, the high exactly. sugar, yeah, you go which any of the impoverished areas around yeah. here. But it's, that's all it it's is. also it's a catch twenty two. It is my niece's husband is a Walmart manager. Yeah, Walmart has tried going into some of those areas. The the people in those areas have stolen blind. And oh sure. So. Stores can't afford, yeah. even the little small grocer can't afford yeah. to put a business in that area yeah. if if he's not going to be able to make any kind of profit. Oh, yeah. it, you know. I, I had a professor in seminary who said, never underestimate the pervasive power of sin. Not just, I punched my sister so they went and kicked the dog. It's, mm -hmm. it's systems and it's all these things that rebound on each other and feed each other, these catch-22s, these no-win situations, and it is tangled and it's... it's it, it hurts people's lives. And, but it's, there's just not one little thing of it. Oh, no. You know? And that's that's what, yeah. you know, we're coming up on election season. Everybody's going to say, well, just do this one thing and that'll fix everything. Well, it's never just one thing. It's always more. Anyway, we got to get out on time. This is an eight-week study on four chapters. Well, next, <laughs> next week is pretty short and it's mostly greetings and goodbyes. So we <laughs> We can make it work. All right. So I will just say that this is called a vice list, that, that these were very common in ancient literature, especially biblical literature. Um, it was a common means of exhort, ex exhortion, not extortion, exhortion. So to exhort people to live a better life. Um, and what the, what this is saying is, you know, all this stuff about access to God and these spirits and these angels, it's coming back to, hey, you still live in this life, in your body, with these other people around you. So then these are the things you shouldn't do. Because the common thread is most of these are you being turned in on yourself. What benefits you? You're going to be angry, then you're going to yell at somebody and not try to work reconciliation. If you're going to be greedy, it's for yourself. If it's fornication, it's not honoring covenants and things like that. If it's, you know, slander, you know, then you're, you know, killing somebody else's reputation, right? You know, don't lie. All because you've stripped off the old self. You've clothed yourself with a new self. There's some baptismal energy and imagery there, uh, right? But when you were baptized, what usually kids are in white or folks put something nice on. There was this this new garments that you put on after you came out of the water and the baptism ceremonies then. So all of this stuff kind of goes together. I do want to do a little compare and contrast. There was that list at the end that Roger read. There's no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, which is kind of the same. Barbarian Scythian Scythians were like the uber barbarians. They were um, ancient nomadic people seen as the ultimate barbarians. Okay, um, slave and free. Christ is all and in all. But if you go back to Galatians chapter three twenty eight, there's the it's a couple of books before this. It's Philippians, Ephesians, then Galatians going backwards. So 328, this is kind of the often quoted one. Uh, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. 
there is no longer male and female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Okay? Similar list. And so, but you can tell, like we said the other week, that Colossians was probably the next generation because what got left off Paul's list between now and here? Can you see what got left off? Slave. Nope, that one's there. That's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at if you look at the list from Galatians and knowing that was Paul for sure, and then you look at Colossians, which was probably the next generation, what thing from Galatians got left off the list in Colossians? Galatians three, what? What? Male and female. And now I introduce you to the household codes. So let's Keep that in mind, the male and female part, and let's transition to verses. We're going to skip a little bit. I want to do this this order. Go to verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. Who would like to read that? Oh, Not, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, read it with, with vengeance. Go for it, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do you notice the difference right there already? <laughs> yes. Okay, just making sure. Everybody heard the difference there? Everything <laughs> for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, mm -hmm. or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in <clears throat> everything you do. It not only win their eyes on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also a master in heaven. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to do another co contrast here. Go to First Corinthians, a couple chapters or a couple books before. Go to First Corinthians seven. <laughs> Hold on. Seven, three to four. Well, I'm just the first time. well, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah, Paul was all for the whole abstinence thing. Um, so verses three and four. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. <laughs> likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So they're, okay, so at least it's both ways in <laughs> First Corinthians, right? But if you go back to Colossians, it says, wives be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, never treat them harshly. It's not, right, it's not the same thing. That's why um, you can find almost anything in the Bible for a long Oh, yeah, view. yeah. So that's why you do context, context, context. So now chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, skip ahead to verses 21 to 24. This is the part about slaves and masters. So here, were you a slave when called? Sorry, this is 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Yep, 1 Corinthians. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. Even if you can gain your freedom, make use of your present condition now more than ever. For whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed person belonging to the Lord, just as whoever was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human masters. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remains with God. Or there remain with God. So again, it's still recognizing that slavery was a part of the culture, but it's saying flip the script both ways. If you were free, you're a slave to Christ. If you were a slave, you're free in Christ. It's 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 sort of like that part from Isaiah and John the Baptist where the mountains will be brought low, the valleys will be brought up, the crooked wings made straight. So Paul was very much trying to level the playing field, at least in terms of, of how you thought about it, even if it didn't change the actual culture around you. Basically in the eyes of God, it's the region. Right, which was a mind-blowing premise. We'll now go back to Colossians 3. 
um, verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves in it as done for the Lord and not for your masters, since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. So you're kind of SOL, which means sort of out of luck. Now, um, <laughs> that's what I heard, which means you're sort of out of luck now. And that means that later on, hey, I had a teacher who told me to not to use BS, bologna sausage. Right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you learn something new every time. You um, so anyway, uh, masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly. For you know, you also have a master. So there's still a little bit of that perspective, but it's already changed. And that's one of the one of the ways folks can see that that this is not Paul directly. This is a disciple of Paul, a, a student of Paul, that this is a little later in time. Um, this is at least the year 60, and a lot of Paul's writings were coming out in like the 40s and 50s. So it, it's probably like 10, 15, 20 years, somewhere in there. They don't know exactly, but at, around a generation. So here's the thing. Um, these household codes were also very common in the writing of this time. They were legislating social duos, right? Anytime that one had power over the other. So if you look at this list, um, you know, there was Greek and Jew, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarians, slave and free, and all the, you know, male and female, and all of these in the culture, one had more sta status and power over the other one. And so there was these household codes to kind of prescribe how you navigated that and how you lived that out. Um, so that, so first of all, like I said, we just named this. This was the society of the time. You know, folks are going to look back. We will try to get out of here uh, by like center. Okay. Are you going outside? You sure? Okay. All right. When the time comes, we will be good stewards of the time. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. It's not that late. Okay. We're good. So that this is a different society. There was a different hierarchy, a different system. Folks are going to look back at our time and culture. 50 years from now and be like what were they thinking you know like across the board that's how we do it we even look back to 30 40 50 years ago and folks are like why were we doing it that way you know that that's normal well that's one of the problems we have in our society today they're trying to put hard mores and morals on people 200 years ago mm -hmm. and wrongly so because it's not fair to those individuals they were in a different time frame yeah so I that's you, you take it where they were at and learn from that context exactly. And you learn from it, you don't forget about it, but that doesn't mean you at the same time need to do it with the way they did it either. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to make them evil. Right. Because, you know, because 250 years from now, they're going to do the same thing to us. And yep. we have no clue what they're going to talk about. That's so right. That's one of the problems I have with some of the stuff that's going on today is we like to put today's mores and morals on somebody yeah. that's two or 300 years ago, and it's not fair. So my sermon today, the, the gospel reading today is all about slaves doing their work and not asking for special treatment. Just do the job you were given, right? And that's just, I rewrote some sentences multiple times because I wanted to try to like soften that or explain it away because that's really jarring to our ears today, especially in this country where we have this whole, you know, slavery thing in our history. Well, still slaves, different system, but still slaves. And at the end of the day, it just that just is what it is. That's how they had their culture then. And Jesus talked about it. And everybody just here, it just it was a part of how it was. They acknowledged it. You can correlate to the employer and employee today, to some degree. Some degree, yeah. So, you know, there's a whole debate. I know I'm not opening the debate. I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> there's this whole debate today about quiet quitting. Should people just do what they're expected to do and go home? Should you do more than what you're expected to do? Is it really fair to call it quitting if you're still going to work and just doing your job? Or is it showing a lack of initiative that you're only doing the bare minimum instead of trying to go? There's a whole debate about that right now in terms of that power differential between the employers and the employees and who's telling the story and how do you, what words do you use, how do you frame it? 
So yeah, these these things are gonna. I've always done people who just did the minimum. Yeah, and then there were people who went above and beyond. Right. Yeah. So yeah. But it is a very uh, is it more now than it is a very hot topic right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree not with today, but you know <laughs> that in light of another day, not yeah, forever. So it's worth that in light of this. Worth today. I mean, I haven't I haven't worked in dollar paycheck for quite a few years, but it's much worse than it was when I retired. Oh yes. No, here, here's <laughs> the difference from today, right? Because I mean, I've been in the industry for a long time. Try. Is sure. for twenty years you would have someone beside you that says. I have a job that's written, I can do my job. Today, you have news articles and news reports and True. This, this broader conversation yeah. around that. And so it's it, always existed nice way. Is it phoning it in or is it having a good work home life balance? Like it depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. It depends on and the motivation. Well, what, what would Paul say, Christ? And that's my question. So I'm going to. Yeah, should you always be on? So here's the thing. Here's my question. I'm going to, can we can apply it to the quiet quitting thing or we can apply it to the, um, uh, the, the, the household code here. How is Christ's resurrection in breaking? So I've talked about that before. They talked about that, that Christ's resurrection changes you now, even though you're not resurrected yet. How does that change your life now? How does this future promise affect you now? How does it transform your life? In these household codes, in this quiet quitting conversation, where is Christ in that? How is the resurrection promise of the future breaking into these rules or breaking into our current work conversations? So if we can find the gospel in that, if we can find where Christ is in the midst of this, or at least a, a couple breadcrumbs of the trail, that helps us, that helps to guide us in terms of how we participate in these conversations and debates. So as you read the household code of wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters, where is Christ in this? You will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Okay. But also to set an example, like you said earlier, if you're, if they were new, and I think it's the same thing today, quite frankly. Um, they were new and they weren't the number one religion. So they had, everybody's looking at them, looking for their flaws. So you always had to put your best foot forward so you didn't have that problem about being ostracized. Sure. Um, I think, believe it or not, we're in that situation today. So uh, I think it has a lot to do with, it says, I guess what, how I was grown raised, I guess. But you have, you have to live with yourself. In other words, I always tell the way I have to sleep with myself at night. Uh, meaning, I can't cut it short. I, you got to, I don't know, self worth, I guess, is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, and people at work, I, I overdo more than some. And I'm not bragging about this, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because I got some young people working with me, and they, just, they think I'm crazy, that I'm stupid <laughs> doing that. I don't have to do that. And yeah. I think that's wrong. I yeah. think um, if you're there to work and you're getting paid to work, you do your job. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, no. so I, I hear and read this differently, and I think part of it's because in my world, governance and authority and things like that are stuff I read all, all the time, right? So when I see, like, husbands and wives, mm -hmm. slaves, servants and servants and all that, like, to me, it doesn't necessarily mean slave with all the baggage sure. of slavery in the U.S. No, no. or whatever. No, different But, different but what I hear is that sort of where is the authority? What are the expectations? That kind of thing. So where Christ fits in, mm -hmm. the way that I read this is everyone's accountable to somebody yeah. or something. And as we're fulfilling our responsibilities, we should be fulfilling them as though the per the person with authority over us is Christ. And then the person with the authority needs to be acting Christ like as well. It, it should convey yes. all things. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 does he say? That if you're a woman, a terrible husband, right? You're now yeah. excused. It didn't get into the nuances. Right? No. Yeah. If you're a husband with a terrible wife, does it excuse? Yeah. You know, it's I read this as it's still a sure. it's calling the individual to serve others as though they're serving Christ. Yeah. Regardless of the rest of the situation. In the, and I, in the Lutheran study Bible, right over the side, it says 
In the ancient world, there were instructions to establish proper conduct for the members of the household for wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters. Here, they are being modified for Christian households so that love for each other and respect for the Lord becomes the guiding values for life. And I think, you know, yeah. just... So that's the thing. Luther also talked about vocations, right? So we have all of us these different vocations as husband, wife, parent, kid, citizen, employee, employer. And so you live out your faith through these vocations. These are vocation. The word vocation means calling. Right? Okay, so you're being called to live these in a Christ-like way and to respect the authorities. And so, but that's how we do this. Like you say, okay, so we recognize the context and the culture of the time that they had these really strict hierarchies. And we have our own, but not the same. So we can't just overlay our stuff, as you were saying, onto this. But at the same time, we can't necessarily look at this and say, you know, this is the same culture, so we should live that way. But finding a, a, a road through it like that, I think is helpful to say, well, how do you bring Christ into this? Well, act as though Christ is your authority. So you do the relationship in that direction. But also in the other direction, act Christ-like to those who are under your authority. You know, Luther had a whole thing about, you know, how do I be a Christian shoemaker? Do I put little crosses on my shoes? Like, no, you just make good shoes and don't gouge your customers. Like, that's so, okay. No, don't do that. No, do yeah, but that's not what I read. No. Right. So, so here's here's what the experts say on this. There's there's four theories. I, I am gonna I'm gonna do a little shame on you. I know I know of a second. Trying to get away from. It. Okay. There's four theories. This is from a guy named Bart Ehrman. He does a lot of writing on. Um, the, I think you may have talked about him before. He's a New Testament scholar. <laughs> Who was it? Bart Ehrman? Yeah. Maybe. Anyway. So he's got, in his textbook that I still have on my shelf, um, just an overview of, of the New Testament. There's four theories about this whole household code thing. Like, why were, why was there difference from, slight, slight but distinct difference from Paul to, they call it Deuteropaul, the second generation of Paul. Um, because even in in Paul's letters, yes, there's the one thing where it says women shouldn't talk in church, but there was a very strong possibility that that had to do with that specific situation in Corinth, because all throughout the rest of Paul's letters, he's greeting other women, talking about the woman who has a church in her house, you know, naming them as leaders, greeting them, all these things. But by the time you get here, not so much. So why why is there this this slight but distinct difference? There's four four theories. Number one. Since Christians stopped believing that the end ha was coming right away, because people started to die and weren't being resurrected immediately, um, they needed to uh, devise better rules for how they could continue to function in their social arrangements with one another. Okay, so we're still here, and we didn't die and get resurrected, so okay, we got to acknowledge that. Number two, some Christians... Uh, were claiming that all people had an equal standing in Christ and had begun to urge a radical egalitarian form of community in which no one had precedence over anyone else. And so if you look at the stuff from Paul, husbands, wives, slave-free, male, female, Jew, Greek, okay. Um, the household rules were intended to put a halt to that way of thinking. Knock it off. Okay, that's going to get us, that, that's not going to go over well. Which leads to number three. Christians began to experience severe persecution from those who were outside and needed to formulate social bonds with one another so as to provide a more cohesive front with which to stand, uh, to withstand the barrage of persecution. Okay, so we're going to do this in a Christ-like way. We're going to take the rules that were there, but we're going to put a Christ-like spin on it. Wait, maybe you were reading that. Um, but we still need to kind of go with the cultural rules so we don't get this persecution even more so. And number four, Christians had been accused of social improprieties, so they would do like, what we do as the sharing of the peace used to be known as the love kiss. or the, So people would just kiss each other. And so people thought they were doing immoral things because they, they're kissing each other in worship or they're eating the body of Christ. They're cannibals. Like, I kid you not. Like, yeah. 
people thought Christians were weird, you know, incestuous vampires. Okay, so um, so they've been accused of social improprieties and needed to demonstrate to the world that they were socially respectable and free from any radical tendencies. Or option five, more likely some combination of all of these things. So they were under enormous pressure now that they were in the next generation to somehow conform to the world while still having Christ be a part of it. So now you get these household colds with a Christian spin and this different perspective. And that shows you the progression from Paul to Deuteropaul and how things had to adapt. Or maybe they didn't have to, but they did. And so there you go. Um, and so I know what's comparable today. In what ways are we still trying to, con and we, we talked about, uh, I think it was you, Darren, who's saying nowadays the, the world is a lot of the things on this list. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do we conform without losing who we are? How do we, we talked about this last week, how are we all things to all people so that they can hear the gospel from us without losing our Christian identity so much that it doesn't mean anything? So there's always this tug, there's always this push and pull. Yeah, I don't think you tip the browbeat people to say, you know, you gotta see the stuff of being built and to be saved and all that. I think you can show your religion or your or your faith, if I'll put it that way, whatever. Sure. Is on your honesty, sure. How you treat people yeah. and how you talk to people. Yeah. There's more so than anything else. Completely. But I think we've overcorrected as Christians in the last fifty years or so by only trying to have our actions demonstrated and never actually talking about it. Because well, that's private, that's personal. I don't want to impose myself on them because of the sandwich board people and the door knockers and the, you know, the fire and brimstone kind of folks. We've overcorrected to say, well, we're never going to talk about our faith. We'll just let our actions speak for ourselves. Well, that, that's too subtle. And then folks aren't going to get the Christian witness unless you're a little bit more. Because there are a lot of well, I good people. Do that. Exactly. And you know what? You can go to the Kiwanis or the Rotary or the Lions and do a lot of good community works and serve your neighbor and help the disadvantaged. How are we different? You can have fellowship and, and, and connections and community at a country club. How are we different? You know, are we, uh, there's the thing that says, a, is a church just a country club with a steeple on top? You know, like what sets us apart? Where is the witness? Motivation. The motivation, sure. The, the promises that give us hope. Um, the this this break, in breaking of, of heaven and, and resurrection affecting us transforming us now and we say our kingdom come and Luther says God's kingdom is going to come without our praying for it but we pray ask in this prayer that it would also come in and through us. So I have some of an issue with some. Of I think first and foremost you have to show what kind of individual you are because you're going to have people following the Bible. Oh sure and and. and do more damage than their personal lives than, than otherwise. So I think that has to be done first. Yeah. And then if you can't get that far with it, you're not going to get them any farther. So you still have to set a good example. Of what doing. Totally. And that's yeah. what they're saying right here. Don't do these things on the bad list. And if we have time, we'll do the things you should do on the good list. When you're um, like setting an example, which, you know, what a Christian might be, I think the, the person that you're talking to, if they are interested, I think they're going to ask you questions about it. Yeah. I mean, instead of, you know, going yeah. like browbeating. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know, I, I just think they'll get the idea and they, at a later time, even come back and talk sure. to you about it. And there's, there's a distinction there. There's this great movie called Saved, very satirical, very interesting take. It's this conservative Christian high school and how, again, do you walk the walk? So they're going to praise Jesus, but then how are they treating the, kind of the outcasts in the school? So it's a high school movie with like some religious social commentary on top of it. And there's this great scene where they think their friend is possessed and they're going to perform an exorcism on her. <laughs> um, and so they actually like try to kidnap her and throw her in a van to perform this exorcism. And she's like, get off of me. I don't want this. And starts walking away. And Mandy Moore, a young Mandy Moore, who if you watch This Is Us or whatever, uh, is the, the kind of mean girl. Um, she grabs her Bible, 
chucks it at her and hits her in the back as she's walking away. And the girl picks up the Bible and goes, this is not a weapon. <laughs> it's just great. It's funny, but it's also this great message. So if you're browbeating, if you're trying to use your faith, your Bible as a weapon to like force people to do something, that's not going to probably oh, change your heart. Yeah. But if you share a story like, you know, I was at church the other day and yeah. we, you know, you should have heard this one kid asking questions in the children's sermon. Like it was yeah. so cute. And then everybody was like, patting her on the back and loving her afterwards that's not necessarily saying you need to think like i think but it's a little bit of an extra than just saying i was kind to somebody and they asked me why are you so kind why are you so patient why are you so generous so you can still work in a little bit of extra witness you can say oh, we went on a we went to the to msef the other day well, why were you there all well, of my, my church supports them we do these things so you can you can create openings how can you get along with it? And I just do. I, I, I don't go any deeper. Now, I get See, that with, was an opportunity. They like, well, I get along with everybody. I don't do any socializing, but I get along with it very well. Sure. There's no conversation. Yeah. Uh, and it makes life a lot easier for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> See, but there's a little bit of an opportunity there to say, well, you know, I, I try my best to get along with folks, but I also try to keep in mind that, you know, God loved me when I wasn't perfect, so I try to extend yeah. that. Just a little, a little bit, a little bit can go a long way. You know, you're not trying to convert them on the spot, but oh my gosh, you just you did a public <laughs> witness, you know, like, you know, that, <coughs> which, you know, is not a super Lutheran thing. Yeah. But, yeah, I was, it, but it should be. That's yeah, you're right. Idea. You're right. It should. We're the evangelical Lutheran yeah. Church of America. We should be like. Well, you don't know how to say it or spell it. <laughs> or just name oh, let's say. So I was going to say. So just like there might be somebody who has eaten tomatoes their whole life, but didn't know that you could cut it or turn it into a sauce, there are plenty of Christians who have gone to church, looked at the Bible, or at least had Christiany things in their life all their life long who have no idea about some of these basics. That's why Luther made the small catechism. He was going around to these churches and like, they don't know anything. So Ten Commandments, Apostles' Creed, Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Communion. Here's a booklet. Here's a pamphlet. Learn this in your book. So, I mean, just patience with one another, different branches of denominations of Christianity. Um, just because somebody has the name Christian on them doesn't mean they understand Jesus' teachings. I mean, I'd like to think I'm still learning. I think Sunday school is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess because I've gone since I was, you know, Lehigh or Grasshopper, but going to church and, and listening and worshiping, that's important too. Yeah. But where you really dig deeper and learn is through Sunday school and Bible studies and, you know, retreats. Yeah. And, yeah. And, this yeah, Bible study is brought to you by Donna Combs. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just saying, no, thank you for the shout out. That's what we're doing. So watch all our videos online. This is where you go. I told the teacher part of I know. I told Pastor Lou. Oh, we got two going at the same time. I told Pastor Lou at one time, I said, don't take this wrong, but I got more out of Bible out of Bible class than I got out of sermon. Um, I've had people tell me they got more out of the children's sermon than the rest of the yeah. service. Because, <laughs> well, because if you can crystallize what you want to say for the kids to understand, then for sure everybody's gonna. My understand. mom says that almost every Sunday. She says, "Yes, John Sermon spoke better than the uh, sermon sermon." <laughs> I figure if I at least get something there, then I'm, I'm covered. Yeah. You need more attention. Your what? children's sermons are very animated. <laughs> Try them. You get a real sermon rolling around on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is why I say that. When you're in a church, it's a one-way yeah communication. Yeah, it's you to us. This and, is. And, Classes, it's different to broaden your horizons because of other input coming into it. So I get more out of this, this type of mm -hmm. uh, scenario or situation than I do sitting in church. You get oh. people's, um, yeah, you know, opinion about things and it kind of puts things in perspective. Oh, yeah. I never thought of it that way. And I think it's confirmation that we don't always know it all, oh, no gosh. matter what state we are in our lives. Like we mm -hmm. constantly learn there's more to yes. understand and. and Hearing others talk about it, that interaction, engagement—it's just, yeah, it's just information yeah. that. I don't know if it's because I'm getting closer to my time, but uh, <laughs> but but the older you get, the more perceptive 
become and more yeah. uh, accept usually yeah you know, I know I, that's because i'm getting closer to meeting the old man himself or <laughs> or just because of my age I'm I, not think, I think it's just ex have, yeah experience yeah um, but i'm more i'm more perceptive to it than i was when i was younger. so i i come with a list of notes but because of the things that folks bring up different perspectives, different stories. I can't think of everything. I'm glad I don't. But that challenges me. That makes me think on my feet. That makes me reply. You're on camera, right? Me? Sure, put it on the desk. <laughs> I'll take a cupcake. Thank you. So anyway, um, I had somebody, I'll, I'll close with this. So we'll, next time we will take the part we skipped, verses 12 through 20, or sorry, 12 through 17, which is what I like to use at weddings and premarital counseling. And that'll be, so we had the vice list, how not to live. We had the household code, the, the structures to stick to. And next week we'll do this verses 12 through 17 on how to live. And we'll close out the letter with chapter four and the, the sort of greetings and things like that. That's a little bit more boilerplate, a little less instructive, but we can still learn from it. But I will close by saying that I had a, a guy from the other Lutheran church across town come to a forum we were doing back in 2009 over a very divisive issue. And uh, he was saying, you know, we were trying to do this whole Bible study thing. And he says, you pastors make things too complicated. Everything I needed to know about, you have too much education, he said. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he said, everything I needed to know about, about God and living the faith, I learned in Sunday school and in kindergarten. You guys make it too complicated. And I'll always remember saying to him, well, after a moment of kind of going, okay, saying, I, I, I think you're right. We get the core and the basics of what we need in Sunday school. But I hope that's not where you stop there. I hope that as you grow, you keep coming back to this living word as you are a different person, as you have new experiences and have new conversations with God through the word and that you're open to learning and deepening your faith. And I, I appreciate that too around this table. It's, you gotta look at it another way. When you you want something, if you want electric, electrical work done or plumbing done in your house, you're not gonna take the guy and just put a placard up and says, "I think I can do that." Well. You're gonna want somebody that's had the education and experience and how to do it so it's done correctly. You can um, you, you, can't, <laughs> you might get lucky. You, you may get lucky that you have a guy that's a good plumber just sure just by nature. But in the golden rule of multiple. That's not something to change. You know, need something to and we didn't even touch on that. So among all the different angels and, and religions in our world, there's also just YouTube. There's also the internet. As somebody said, you can use the Bible to justify anything. You can use the internet to justify anything. So what is that in, in the is the internet is the internet sort of like a, a, a pantheon buffet? Like can you just find the God of your choosing on the internet? And have it teach you what you Viewpoints. Yeah. Same and the algorithms news. are going to give you videos that match Same what you just watched. Yeah. Customize your life down to, yeah. I am a Christian that believes only Paul's letters that were written in capital letters. And I can bet you I can find a uh, nomination out there. That teach oh, sure. Well, and that's not even new because uh, Thomas Jefferson tried to take all four Gospels and go and just stick them together into one and edit out the parts he didn't like, a lot of the Jewish stuff. Yeah, he's so he just went with that. Yeah, that, because that wasn't scientifically provable. So yeah. just take all of it, just go, and you talk about what you can learn on the internet. I was still working at that 15 years ago. <laughs> my, my boss, just for giggles one day, for Lark, he's found this one site on the internet where they're making a ministry. Oh, I sure. Send him, all you have to do is send him $45 and send him to read. So he always go around and says, I can marry you. <laughs> and just just for kicks too there's if you go online you can find a, a martin luther insult generator because he liked to insult his opponents and call them all sorts of goat thing names so if you want to go online you can find a martin luther insult generator anyway yeah. on that note that's, that's fine and there's a shakespearean one too wait is that what you just said oh yeah it's fine <laughs> anyway, thanks everybody. This got off the rails, but in a good way. So um, it's good to go off road sometimes because God doesn't usually want us to stay in our ruts. So um, we'll finish this up next time. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's working. our prayer for this week is for God, is for us to find Christ in our society, see where Christ is up to and help us understand both the scripture and now and the intersection and where God is calling us to live out our vocations. So we'll end on that note. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.